Hi there, this is the Admin Junior, and this tutorial is the first in a tutorial series on the Blender game engine. It will also incorporate some Python scripting, and in doing so, we'll continue the Python for Blender tutorial series. Game creation is all about understanding the fundamentals and also about collaborating with other people. It's very much a, a team exercise, as it were. Um, but game creation is all about the fundamentals. And so this slideshow, which I'm about to show you, will showcase uh, just some of the basic um, ideas associated with games. Now the game we're going to be making is a driving game. It'll be quite simple graphically. I mean, I'm just going to leave that up to you, to be honest. Um, but what we're going to focus on is the actual gameplay um, and things about motion, movement. We're going to be doing some Python scripting, and we're going to be working with uh, the logic editor. So. To start off with our little presentation, we have the traditional model. Now, because this, we're creating a driving game, um, this is all going to be based upon uh, the accelerator pedal inside a car. So, in real life, uh, RL, um, we have an accelerator pedal, and when we press the pedal, in real time, as soon as we do it, the car accelerates. The two are dependent upon the other. In the game world, things work a bit differently. Because games are programs, they have to follow a logical order, a logical progression. If we did things in real time, what would end up would you know it would be really, really inefficient. And with game creation, we always strive to make it as efficient as is physically possible while still maintaining as much functionality as we can. So, what we do is we keep it in this loop, a main loop as it were. And it all starts off with the game rendering the first frame. All of this happens within the space of a frame, by the way. So the game will render the first frame, or in our case, the car. And this is called the draw method. Then after that, we have the update method, and this is where the code really kicks in. And what we do is we apply things like physics, and we check for whether you know, user controls, whether the uh, forward button is pressed, the space bar is pressed, whatever. And this will happen inside the update method. And if it's if 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 the pedal's pressed, it changes the car's location. That's that's part of the update method, just reflecting that. And then what happens is after the update method, it goes back to the draw method. So the car is then re-rendered in its new location. Simple enough. But you really need to understand that these things don't actually happen in real time. So this poses the question, when do we update the game? Well, the obvious answer would be by frame. So every time that loop executes, you run an update method. The problem with this is that not everybody runs the game at the same frame rate. So somebody could be running at 90 frames per second, somebody could be running it at 30. We have to account for that in our programming in such a way that the updates will happen uh, at a good speed, at a constant speed, relative to everybody else. So there are a number of ways we can achieve this. One of them is by limiting the frame rate, but of course that's detrimental if people like you know people like to have high frame rates if they have the hardware. So that's not really always a good idea. Uh, and secondly, of course, there's um, you can actually use the current frames per second in your calculations. The problem with that is uh, every update method has to calculate the current frames per second. 
which is slightly, you know, it, it's it's intensive, so it's actually inefficient in some ways. The alternative is to do things by time. So say every, what, 100 milliseconds, the update method is run. Now this keeps everything uniform, speed-wise, on pretty much any computer. So, personally, this is my preferred method, doing it by time. I mean, all you have to do, really, is check the um, current system time and uh, check it against um, a certain increment. So, that's something to consider when you're making games. Blender does things in a rather interesting way. We use node-like objects. They're not really nodes per se. They're called logic blocks. Now, we have three different types of these. First and foremost, sensors, controllers, and finally, actuators. Sensors tell Blender what to look out for while the game is running. So it'll check for key presses, it'll check for whether the mouse button is down, and there are also other things, but we'll come to those when we get to them. <laughs> Next we have controllers. These act as a go-between for the sensors and actuators. They also denote if an actuator is run or not, and can execute scripts. Now you may not understand that at this point, but you hopefully will again when we get to it. And finally we have actuators. These are the things that actually do something. That's really all I have to say about them. Right, so that's the end of the uh, presentation. And now we're actually going to go and apply some of this to Blender. Okay, so I've started up with my default cube. I think I'll just create a logic editor down here. There it is. Zoom out. Okay. So, here we have our sensors, controllers, and actuators. Now, this might take a bit getting used to for those who aren't really familiar with it. Basically, everything centers around the add button, and we have lots of lots of options of what to add. So I'm just going to show you a very simple example of moving a cube upwards uh, using the spacebar. So I'm going to add a new sensor, it's going to be a keyboard sensor. Now we have this sort of panel here, rather like a node. We can give it a name and I would, when actually doing it properly, I would definitely, I, I hate name, naming things. <laughs> to be honest, I find it really boring, and I don't do it usually. But when you're doing, when you're actually making proper games, or at least having attempt, um, you you really do need to actually name them because things can get really cluttered otherwise. So I'm going to pull a space press or something. I don't know. So what we have here is this little panel um, to do with frequency, which we're going to leave alone for now. Key course you designate which key to check for and if you click on this button here sort of toggle button then it asks you to press a key press a key and it's assigned modifiers are things like uh, control alt shift so you can have control as a first modifier alt as a second modifier and we can just ignore um, target and log toggle for now as well Right, so now we've got our sensor set up. Next we move on to our controller. Now basically, if in doubt, use an AND. We have a selection of some um, well, gates, operators, boolean operators, whatever you want to call them. Um, I'm just going to select AND. Again, I will go over these in more detail at some point. And I'm going to select a motion actuator from here. Now, like nodes, we link these up by clicking and dragging from hole to hole. Like that. 
There you go. So these are all now linked up and will work. So we come to the motion node, logic block, whatever. Um, I'm just going to use simple motion. These two here are very important buttons, actually, toggle buttons, and they denote whether the actual motion is local or global. Now, nine times out of ten, you're going to want local motion. So, if the cube was rotated because it knocked into something, it would actually, you know, it's a difference between going upwards like that and rotating the cube. You know, so its its top face is actually pointing in this direction. But if we do it globally, it's still going to move upwards like that. If we do it locally, it will actually move like that. So there's a it's a you you do need to know the difference between global and local movement, just in general. So here we have x, y, and z values for location and rotation. Now. Blender does things by frame, so um, so the update method is called by frame. You can think of this logic uh, editor thing here as basically the update method. It checks to see if something's checks to just check something, and it just and then it affects the properties, and then it's drawn in the draw method. So this is really the update method here. So I'm just going to affect the Z location locally by 0.03, I think. And that will do for now. If you want to see more extended options with the cube, don't forget to swap the engine up here. So we'll have other different render engines, like eventually Lux Render, when I finally get Lux Blend 2.5 working properly. Um, Povray... Uh, no, the blender render just render engines if we select blender game from here then we have well, some really cool different options here so we've got some sound some shading I would always uh, advise selecting GLSL that's um, a more recent modern technology we now got we've got physics down here as well now so we're gonna choose a physics engine you can actually I believe make your own custom physics engines I mean I do make physics engines, but not for Blender because I use uh, C Sharp rather than Python. So uh, I don't really make my own custom ones. And under the um, where, where are we? Let's have a look. There somewhere. Yeah, under physics, we can now change the physics type. So I've got uh, a couple of different ones here, and I'm just going to keep it static. Right. Now, if you go back to the render settings, render tab thing here, um, if we if we uh, tick frame rate and profile, we should be able to see the frame rate. And I'm just going to press the start game engine. Now, because we've checked frame rate and profile, we sh now should have some frames per second up here. So we're running at a sturdy 50 frames per second. Well, 45. Um, and it's also showing the percentage usage of the CPU, I think, actually, uh, for physics, logic networks, scene graphs, sound, rasterizer services overhead and outside. Again, none of these are particularly important at the moment. Won't really have to worry about it. Okay, maybe not. CPU usage is rasterizer's 98%. It must be just the resources. Okay, so at the moment, We've got our cube here. Now, it is completely white. If I go back to 3 3D view port and rotate it, you can see it's completely white. This is because it just takes the data from textured. And although this is black here, it makes it white. So what we need to do is add a light source. And we do this just as we would normally. Lamp. I'm going to use point lamp. <clears throat> as opposed to a spot or anything, because I do for games. And if we now add the point lamp, we can see we've got some proper shading going on. So, now we're going to test if our whole spacebar thing, coupled to the simple motion, is going to work properly. Press P to start the game, 
and press the space bar. There we go. We can see the cube move and in fact the shade shading update as well. Excellent. So that's really your first game. The next tutorial will be a more in-depth look at the logic editor, uh, looking at some of the different logic blocks, and we're actually going to start doing some Python programming as well.